Hello, everyone, and welcome to another amazing episode of The Joy of Being for busy working mums and women in business and beyond who are seeking to unplug from their worries and overwhelm to light up with insight and joy. I, your host, mum, and effortless lifestyle coach, Marina Pearson, talk to transformational professionals, business owners, and creatives about what it really takes to have a business and life you can truly enjoy. And today I've got some amazing news. You can now pre-order your very own version of the Joy of Being book, supporting hardworking mums to stress less and live more. If you're the type of mum who is struggling with the burdens of motherhood or modern day life, then this will be a perfect book for you. If you're curious, you want to know more and you want to see what's up with that book, you can do so at www.marinapearson.com slash order. And there you'll find all the amazing goodies that you'll get if you pre-order the book before the 10th of May. And on today's show, I have the beautiful Elaine Hiladies. Elaine has been coaching for many, many years. And during those years, she studied lots of different theories and therapies, including NLP, TFT, CBT. However, in 2009, she was introduced to the Prince principles of mind, consciousness, and thought, and apparently everything else fell into place. So it made no sense for her to continue using the old methods, and she worked with this paradigm ever since. She's been lucky enough to have studied with leading practitioners in the field and has completed more than one practitioner course. And then in 2011, she undertook a training trainers program with Dr. Mark Howard and Kathy Casey, who are very well known in this area. She's an international coach and speaker and started the first wellbeing workshop in the UK in 2012 using these principles that she shares and was helping recovery from drug, alcohol and mental illness. She's also a certified diet, nutrition and raw food advisor and she's published a Kindle book in 2013 about weight issues. What I loved about this conversation with Elaine was her matter of factness. Apparently she's been called a pragmatist. She's very down to earth about what she's seen in the area of depression. And of course, like with all of these episodes, we talked about how this actually can affect mums especially. So we talked about what she's seen and the miracles that she's experienced when her clients have actually seen something for themselves. So myths like it's going to take forever or it's going to take lots of years to recover from depression were just thrown out of the window. She talks of clients being able to recover in a moment. And we also talked about how worrying for our children doesn't necessarily help them either. And amongst all of this, what I heard for myself was how truly resilient we all are, including our children. If you are suffering from depression, or if your children are suffering from depression, or you know somebody that is, then this is going to be an amazing episode for you. Enjoy. So on today's show, we've got the amazing Elaine. Hi, Elaine. So wonderful to have you here. Thank you for asking me. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure. So Elaine just informed me that we actually met each other six years ago when I first got introduced to the principles behind life. She has a much better memory than me because I certainly didn't remember that. (laughs) And I, I reached out because I've seen that depression is a, is a big theme, as it were. And my observation is on Instagram, there are a lot of mums that, that, that struggle with it, which is why I wanted to bring Elaine on to sort of talk about what she's seen, what's been helpful. So Elaine, a place I'd love to start is, is what got you interested in, and I know you work in different areas, but specifically in this area of what we could be perceived as depression well I think I don't think there's a person alive that hasn't had some form of depression whether they've caused it uh prolonged periods have been just fed up or they've actually gone down the clinical depression route I think almost everybody if they haven't experienced it they certainly have um experienced members of the family or friends um going through this kind of thing and when I came across the principles it just made so much sense to me to share it in in this as one of the many areas in this area because we know that the the principles are not uh they're not a panacea they're not they're not anything that can help us win they're just description of why and that made it so comfortable to work with it in this area because i think when somebody is feeling depressed depression is a label isn't it that that once we're given i am depressed and we know that anything 
that starts with I am is a bit of a story anyway. But, but it's easy to cling on to the label because it makes sense of what we've been feeling. And it's not a nice feeling and everybody wants to make sense of it. And when I came across the principles and understood that it's okay to feel depressed, it's okay to have horrible, horrible feelings. But what the principles shone a light on was that you don't have to stay in that feeling. When, when we have a label like depression or cancer or, I don't know, any other label that we can think of, it's easy to become the label. And then it's easy to make all of our experience around that label. And I found that when people were depressed, they, they actually innocently omitted from their own minds any, any moments of joy. They, they just completely forgot them. It wasn't that they were trying to deny them. They just didn't see them they, they just their focus was elsewhere and i had a client once who um we used to we used to have some phone conversations because she was so depressed she didn't want to do zoom and she lived quite a way away so we used to talk by phone now she came to me because i had worked with somebody else in her family and i knew that her partner i knew her partner i knew you know i had heard stories about her partner very nice stories and about his daughter from a previous relationship and I, I spoke to her one Monday and I said to her oh you know how was your weekend and she said oh it was awful I, I just I just cried all weekend and I said oh I'm really you know sad that you felt that and, and I said oh by the way how did Ben that's her partner how did he enjoy his birthday and I knew that his birthday was the day before his daughter's birthday so they often had a, some kind of joint celebration and then her voice completely changed and she said to me oh Oh, she said, he, you know, his daughter came over the night before his birthday to stay. She was quite young at the time, about six, I think, the daughter. And she said, oh, and she was so excited because we hid presents around the flat for him. And, and then we did a treasure hunt the next morning. And so listening to all of this, and I'm kind of smiling to myself. And she was talking about that. And then she was talking about how they went out for lunch with, with Ben's dad. And Ben Bolt, and then it was his daughter's birthday party the next day. And they went to the park by it. And I just said, oh, that sounds, that sounds really, you know, really nice. I said, when, when did you have time to cry? And she suddenly said, oh, I didn't, did I? Innocently, it had been her default to go into, that's what she, that's what she normally did. She was off work with depression and she felt that she spent her days crying. And so that's what immediately came to mind when she thought of her day-to-day -day experience. But actually, when it was pointed out that other things had happened, she was able to look in that direction. And she was just able to see, oh, okay, I don't feel like this all the time. Mm. Because I think that's what happens when somebody's depressed. They think this is how they feel all the time. And they're always going to feel like this. Because, you know, as you know, it, there's no point in saying to somebody who's depressed, oh, well, look, you know, think about a holiday you're going on in a few, in a few weeks or a few months. They, they can't. That's just a big black hole. <laughs> that means nothing, do you see? Even say, even if somebody's sitting on their sofa and they have some washing up to do in the kitchen, it's a mountain to climb. It just, it's, there's no point in trying to get them to see the bright side of life. Or It's just far more helpful, I think, to help them to see that, that there, are glimpses, there are glimpses in their day of a different kind of feeling. And then to help them to see how they had that different kind of feeling. And inevitably, it's because at that moment, they weren't thinking about their depression or whatever they considered was causing them to feel depressed. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So I love that. It's a bit like, well, yeah, you just forget about it. <laughs> oh, shit, I'm depressed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you don't see it because the, yeah. the overwhelming feeling is a feeling of depression and however it shows up in people. You know, it can be completely feeling lifeless. It can be feeling, as I say, that there's, there's nothing to live for because in that moment, that's entirely the way the person feels. But, but knowing that it's okay to feel like that, it's not pleasant, but it's okay to feel like that. They don't need to beat themselves up on top of feeling like that because they're feeling like that they don't need to make it mean anything about them but that's that's i think a big thing i have lots of clients that come to me and they say i have a really good life i have nothing to be depressed for and that that of course makes them feel worse right and, they, and then they might have well-meaning people say, and they might have well-meaning 
seen people say to them, well, you know, you've got it good compared to, and they think that if they compare their life to somebody who experiences a peer, a peer snap, strangely enough, it doesn't. Yeah, that makes a lot of so sense. I, I do, yeah, and I do, I mean, you know, if anyone listens to this, that's, that I've, I've told this story before, but um, when I used to run uh, a group for those that were in recovery from alcohol, drugs, and mental health, there was a guy that came to the group and he'd been coming for about a year and he was in so, so well. He, he was attending all the different things that the people that ran the group um, put on. And he'd even started um, going back to lecturing in astronomy, which is what he did years ago, but he spent 17 years locked in his, in his flat. And um, I mean, when I say locked in, he'd locked himself in as, as it were, you know, he didn't want to go out anywhere, he wasn't held captive. And uh, I went to the group one day and he was pacing up and down. And I said to him, oh, Andrew, you know, how are you? And he's kind of pointing his finger and he said, I'm going into a depression. And I said, oh, that's a shame. And, you know, why don't you just come down, sit down and talk to me for a few minutes before the group starts? So he sat down and the day before had been a bank holiday. And I said to him, so, you know, what did you do yesterday? And he started telling me how a friend of his had picked him up and they'd gone to the local garden centre and they'd had coffee and he was telling me about the plants and they'd had lunch. And, you know, you could see he was visibly lifting as he was talking. And, and then the group was about to start and I just kind of nudged him and said, how do you feel now? And he was like, damn, she got me again. And he used to tell the story to people a lot because he said he did feel a bit fed up later, he did feel a bit low, but he didn't go into a depression. Because by talking about something that happened that he'd enjoyed, reminded him of things that he enjoyed and reminded him of the possibility of enjoyment. And he just didn't go where he had thought he was going to go. But imagine if he'd sat down and I said to him, so Andrew, why are you depressed? And he would have told me, wouldn't he? He would have given me all the reasons that he felt he was depressed. And every reason would have been incredibly real to him and would have validated his feeling. So of course he would have felt depressed. And, and sadly, that's what a lot of, that's what a lot of, um, that a lot of times that happens in traditional counseling and, and psychotherapy and that, you know, people that go round and round the perceived problem, but it's, but often the, the thing that seems to be a problem isn't even happening. It's, it was something that maybe happened in the past. But of course, as we know, keep talking about it just makes it feel very real at the moment. Yeah. And so, you know, what do, if somebody's listening in and going, okay, that's all girl and good, but like I'm on antidepressants and I take these drugs and so forth and so on. Can the understanding help with that? Like what's been your experience, Elaine? Well, when I um, very first came into the principles, I came into the principles in 2009. And um, back then there was a, there was, well, there still is a place called Tikkun in, in Finchley Road. And it's a Jewish centre, but it's not, obviously it's religious, but you, it's not, that's not all they talk about. And they used to host a lot of people that came over from the States. So, you know, Kathy Casey, Keith Blevins, George Pransky, etc. Uh, would go and do talks there. And there was a woman there who, um, I know I won't mind me talking about her because she's got a book out. Her name is Toby Waltzer, I think it's Waltzer. And T-O-B-Y, Waltzer. And um, when I first saw her, she she would have her head down. She, she didn't make eye contact with anyone. Um, she was a little bit overweight. And then um, a few years, a couple of years later, I think it was, when I was doing the first One Thought Practitioner, so it might have been in 2010 by then, I, I was partnered with her to do an exercise. And, and she was telling me how she had been severely depressed. And so when I first met her, she was just kind of coming out of the tail end of it. Now, this woman had been on um, very high medication, very, very high medication. And what had happened, I think, I'm, I'm, I'm telling her story, which, you know, she would tell better, but I think what had happened is, and I know she had, I think, maybe two children, and then her third child was, I think, mentally and physically handicapped. And then, I think, sadly, her parents died within quick succession of each other. And then she was pregnant with her fourth child, who was also physically and mentally handicapped. And when she went to the doctor, the doctor said, in all innocence... Anybody would be depressed in your circumstance. Now, this poor woman was going through grief in a lot of areas, grief for her parents, 
grief for the imagined future that she, she thought her children should have, all sorts of things. But he put her on antidepressants. And by the time um, she, she came across the principles, she was on such high, high doses of medication that she wasn't, she said she was just existing really. And anyone that's been on, on medication knows that you kind of live on the periphery of life. Don't you? You never really feel engaged with it. It feels like you're you're, you're in, wrapped in cotton wool. You know, you, your head floods, you can't make sense of things, and it doesn't feel like you're really living. And that's so. It, but she was getting worse and worse, and so they were just about to give her electric shock treatment because that was all they could possibly think to do. They, they couldn't. There was no way they could have her medication anymore. And this woman was uh, the day. I think it was the day before she was going for her um, treatment. Somebody said to her, you must go and listen to this person. And she thought, well, you know, what's to lose? And she went to somebody who was talking about the principles. And she says she does not know what this person said, but everything changed. Not all, it, not all at once. It wasn't like she had like an overnight recovery, but it opened the door. And um, she, she's a different person altogether now. Um, she, she speaks at the annual conference in London. She's got books out. She, she's, if you saw her now, she would say she's kind of the life and soul of the party. Now, you know, that was somebody who had been really in this, at such the, the depth and, and on such high medication. And it was her understanding of how we create life that, that changed everything for her. Everything. And I, I absolutely know there isn't a person that, that cannot see something in this understanding. What a powerful story, Elaine! Like seriously, so it's a, it's amazing. It's, it's not my it's not my story, but to witness that the change in someone like that, it's amazing, amazing. Yeah. So for anybody that's listening in for the first time, because obviously if there are people that are listening in that have been listening in for a while you kind of get now that I talk about these principles, this understanding, and I've interviewed quite a few um, people on it. But just as a, as a, as a, a reminder, Elaine, mm-hmm. could you just share a little bit about that? What you mean by yeah. the three principles, what you mean okay. by this understanding? Well, I, I use this analogy, although I'll have to change it soon because <laughs> people don't use DVD players anymore. But if you think of a DVD player that somebody in the past had, but, um, uh, Mind to me, I, I'm not a religious person. The mind to me is, is what lives us. It's the energy that lives us. It's the energy of life. It's what makes the sea go in and out, what makes the grass grow. And that, that, that's mind. That's, that's just the pure energy. And consciousness. Consciousness is, is what brings thought to life. But consciousness, we don't have our own bit of consciousness, I don't believe. We, all, we have a shared consciousness that we are aware of our bit of. It's a bit like air. You know, we don't think about air. We don't think about my bit of air. We all know that we breathe air. We all know that it's there. But we don't take any notice of it. It's just there. And, and thought is how we create our experience moment to moment. So if you think of a DVD player, you need to plug the DVD player into energy. Otherwise, it's not going to work. So it needs to be plugged in. And then if you think of the player as consciousness, it's, it's, it's there. It can, do, it, can, it can bring any video to life, any DVD to life, but you need to plug the DVD in. And DVD is like the thoughts we have. So, so the DVD player brings to life the DVD that we put in. And, and whatever DVD we put in, that's the experience we're going to get. So... If I plug in a, a rom-com, I'll cry my eyes out. If I plug in a scary film, I'll be terrified. Now, that ha- actually doesn't... It, all those things come together to give me that experience. So that's just kind of how I like to break it down for people, to make it simple. <laughs> Beautiful. So my question, I guess, is then, is why are some of us played with with depression or depressing thinking over those that aren't so much like what why is there that sh- why is there that difference like what is what's going on there because obviously there are people that are plagued by it there are others that aren't yes. um yeah so i'm curious about that yeah and and you know i have i have 
real compassion for people that are suffering real real compassion and and absolute hope that they can they can see that they don't need to suffer all the time but but you see if you're feeling it, it doesn't always feel like you're thinking about anything when you're depressed. It doesn't feel like you're thinking, well, actually, about anything at all. It feels like, you, well, for some people's experience anyway, it can feel like they're just in a fog. They're just in a, a morass of treacle. It's just horrible. And it, they don't, they're not aware that they're thinking. But, of course, we can't not think. Um, the time will come for all of us, but while we're breathing, we can't not think. So we must be having thoughts. Now, we don't notice the thoughts we're having most of the time. You know, you've heard that, you know, experts, there's a guy at Stanton University, Frederick Luskin, that says we have 60,000 thoughts. The Department of Neuroimaging says 70,000 thoughts a day. Some experts go up as high as 100,000 thoughts a day. Now, they can see these by watching the, the electricity in the brain. They can see the neurons firing. They can see the flashes. But, of course, None of those flashes have content. So they're aware that this is roughly how many thoughts we might have a day. But those thoughts aren't, aren't about a specific thing. Now, if you say to anybody, tell me your last 10 thoughts, they couldn't possibly. Because they, they flow through us too quickly. But what happens is we, we get a thought, we, we feel like it's important, and then we keep having the same flavour of thought. And that can be almost unconscious. So often when somebody is feeling really, really depressed, really, really depressed are their levels. It's a bit like being a little bit pregnant, isn't it? But, you know, feeling depressed anyway. They're, um, they're, they're unconsciously going over and over and over something. It could, be, it could be something that's happened in their life. It could be fear that something is going to happen, that, that can take over people. But, but there's probably something they're going over and over. And... You know, I have clients all the time. I have clients, I, I've got a client tomorrow that, that called me and she said to me, I think I'm going mad because I keep, I keep repeating things. And I was like, well, yes, you too. <laughs> now, the more we can see that even in the midst of depression, when somebody keeps repeating something again and again and again, when they, when they have that break, you know, I've heard, I've heard Dick and Bettinger call it like a cloud break. Um, when they have that break and, the, and there's, a, there's a little bit of light, do more of that. And that, that sounds very simple. That sounds like I'm trying to trivialise it. And I, I'm, I'm not. I just mean the more that we can see that there are breaks, and when there are breaks, to notice them. And don't let those pass by and get consumed and subsumed and by the, by the horrible feeling. Is, is this making sense? Yeah, yeah. So to place more attention on those moments that the breaks are there. So a bit like, a bit like what happens if you are, um, if it is a cloudy day, do you focus on whether it's cloudy or whether, or on those moments when the sun comes out? Exactly. You know, and it's funny because somebody was saying yesterday, I was in a shop and people were saying about the weather at the moment, the weather in the UK is particularly sunny. And they were saying, oh, you know, it, it, makes, it makes everybody happy when it's sunny. And I said, well, not everybody. I've got an Italian son-in-law who doesn't like the sunny weather. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, my life, it's sunny again. You know, it's nothing to do with the weather, is it? It's the way we, as you know, the way we, we experience it. But it's, it's not like trying to get somebody to focus on the positive. Because if, you, if you're depressed, there is no way on earth you can focus on the positive. It's, that's, that's really like asking my dog, to, my cat to be a dog. It's not going to happen. It's more just to notice as, as, as your feeling shifts, even for a second or two. Just to notice it. Don't do anything with it. Don't try and bring it back. Don't try and do things that will make you feel like that because they won't. <laughs> but just to notice it. To notice it. And to not make the way you feel mean anything about you like this woman who said you know i think i'm going mad she's just she's just being human and like i have i have clients come to me often that have suicidal thoughts now obviously in my in my kind of work i'm going to get 
probably a, a higher proportion of people that come to me than if I was a, you know, I wouldn't hear about it if I was a house painter maybe. But um, they, when they come to me and they have suicidal thoughts, they think that they're, and they think it's unusual. They think they're kind of, they, they, they label themselves, they think they're bad or they're, they shouldn't be feeling like that. They're not being a good mum because they have these thoughts. And how could I have these thoughts when I've got this perfect child? Or they, they you know, then they start adding layers and layers and layers of, of thought on top of a thought that's already gone. Because the, the thought you're, you're concerned about went ages ago. <laughs> yeah, it's already in the past. As soon as you notice it, it's gone. I remember having this really, really crazy lesson given to me by my son. And it must have been when he was about two and he would ask me, Mama, can I have this? So I'd make it for him. And then he'd be like, oh, I don't want that anymore. I'm like, what yes. do you mean you don't want it anymore? Yes. And I'm just like, oh my God, of course he doesn't. Because he's, he's, he's been on to the next moment in the last yes. 10 minutes. Like oh, he's been waiting for, you know, like oh, it took me about oh, 10 minutes you. to make the thing. And yes. Now, now the moment's gone, he doesn't want it. And Absolutely. I was, I get, I would get really annoyed by that and then realize, oh, the moment's gone. So, of course, absolutely. he's on to the next moment. Yes. And he's not interested in the drink anymore. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> now, now, you know, I mean, I do that myself, don't you? I think, oh, I really fancy something. And then I get busy doing what I'm doing. And then it might be, it might be a drink or it might be, I don't know, uh, uh, I don't know, a piece of chocolate or something. And then you say, oh, do you still want? And I think, oh, no, I don't. That was... That's gone. That's right there. Just like your son, that's gone. I don't, I don't want that now. But, but you see, your reaction it was, is so normal. Because as a parent, we think often that the child is doing something to us. It's like, why are you doing this to me? Why are you, not, not, not Leo in that moment, but why are you crying? Why aren't you enjoying this day I've taken you out? You know, you can go out for the day somewhere like a, in some kind of like a Legoland or something in the UK. And you can hear parents talking to their child. You, maybe the child's playing up or, or crying. And you can hear the child saying, uh, the parent saying to the child, um, why are you doing this to me? I've taken the day off to, to come here. I've, I've, um, I've spent a lot of money. And all those kind of things. Well, the child doesn't care. All the child's reacting to is their thought in this second. Mm. So it's nothing to do with the parent at all. It's to do with the way they're thinking in that moment. But then we take it on board and then we, maybe we get cross and then we think we're a bad parent for getting cross and then we add and add and add and add and add. Well, when you put it like that, it's just like crazy behavior. <laughs> it is, it absolutely we're is. We're all yeah. nuts. We're all nuts, yes, yes. Yeah. I remember listening to Sydney Banks um, recording where he talks about this and he goes, yeah, we're all schizophrenic. One moment we love that person and the next moment they're the worst person in, on the planet. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. This is why, you know, yeah, well, this is a whole different, different subject. If you go into thousands of subjects about that alone. But, but, but you see, if, if, somebody, if somebody is in the depths of depression, done it again, depths, but anyway, if somebody has, uh, is, is feeling depressed, then, and they're a parent. If, so, if, if somebody's feeling depressed and they have no um, other responsibilities apart from, you know, may, maybe making money and whatever, you know, but no, no one depending on them, they can, be, they can be depressed and they can get on with it. And I'm not saying it's a, it's a more pleasant experience at all. But if you've got a little one relying on you, that just feels like a burden. And then we feel so guilty for feeling like this, this perfect child is a burden or however somebody sees it. And then, then then we start to feel really, really bad about feeling that. And then we've, that, we've got more and more and more and more of these feelings. And, and then we wonder why we're depressed yeah what i'm really hearing is layer upon layer of thought like we just layer it on layer it on but it's so innocent isn't it it's so innocent yeah and it, it almost always is with with everything that we're feeling that that we don't like anyway a feeling that that doesn't make us happy is almost always back to thinking about us innocently i don't mean that in a selfish way but it's always to do with us 
why are, as I said, why are you doing this to me? It's not fair that you're doing this. It's not fair that this is happening. You know, all of these feelings, it's always about us. And the more that we can see that none of it is personal, none of it, it doesn't matter if it's the most personal, intimate relationship you're in, it's still not personal. Whatever somebody says or does is actually nothing to do with you. It's always to do with their thoughts, their heads, their thoughts in the moment. And the more we can see that, the more we don't have to make meaning of any of it. And then that's another, that's, that's that shedding the layer. So that, that can then just feel a little bit lighter. Beautiful. There's something that came to mind while you were talking, Elaine, which was in, in what you've seen over the years, because obviously you've been sharing this, this, this understanding for 10 years now. No. Um, <laughs> You're a goodie and an oldie, no. <laughs> an oldie. I'm an oldie. <laughs> oldie, goodie, goodie. What has like surprised you? So, I mean, you know, we're often told, oh, depression is going to take, oh, you're going to have to have years and years of therapy. Where, what have you seen what's possible with, with what you share? Because I, maybe somebody that's listening going, yeah, yeah, that's maybe for somebody else. I'm just curious as to what's possible. What have you seen that's just kind of going, oh my goodness. Like, yeah. Yeah. It, well, it, it can't be for everybody else and not for, for somebody. Because as I say, like air, if you think, you know, the, the principles are just a fair description. I mean, we, we know there's an energy to life. We know that we're conscious and we know that we have thoughts. That happens regardless of the circumstances or the situation. That's going to happen. And I say, if you think about it like air, we always breathe. We, we, we might talk about the quality of air, or, but we never think, Oh, I wonder if air is going to show up today. It's the same for everybody. So the principles can't not apply in any kind of situation or, or be applicable. No, not applicable to somebody. But they, they just can't, they're just not a thing too big to apply to somebody. But if somebody's feeling like, yeah, that's okay for everybody else, but I'm different. Totally, of course you're different. We're all different. But we all have the same experience of creating life moment by moment. Now, I've had people come to me and say that they've been depressed for, you know, 10 years, more than that. I've had, I've had girls that come to me in their 20s that were taken to see a psychotherapist or a psychiatrist when they were 12, who have had all that time, 10 years of, of feeling depressed. And literally, literally within, it could be at one session, they feel differently. They feel differently. They, they, I'm not saying they don't have elements i'm not saying they suddenly are are jumping around click, clicking their heels but once you can see the possibility that you don't have to feel like this forever that's it and as i say the door's open and who, who doesn't want to walk through that door i had one woman that had been that that said to me that she was suffering from trauma and she she lovely lovely lady and she said to me i've had it all my life is there was no before trauma and she had been in many 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 years of therapy and and we had a session she lives she lives overseas and we had a session and and then she contacted me we said you know we like took like 30 years of, of, of therapy and counseling and we had one session and she emailed me and said you know i think the next session i'd like to talk about food <laughs> and I was, you know we, we really laughed about this that she'd had all those years and after one session she thought i can't bother to talk about that anymore. Yeah, it really is. And what um what came to mind when you were talking was a client that I worked with, and she'd she'd been seeing somebody therapist in and out for like five years because of the death of what she she seemed to think that the reason why she was feeling the way she was was because of the death of her dad. And in an earlier um, in an earlier comment, you said that you said something and like person didn't even know what it was but they they yes. saw something new and it was the same for her like we were just talking and suddenly she stopped and she's like oh my god what did you just say and I said I don't know but I don't think it's particularly relevant yes <laughs> yes it's yeah absolutely something for yourself and um she said that literally fi that like it, it just all of that grief just went away yes in that mm -hmm. moment but we weren't even talking about it. We were just talking yes. about something else. I have no idea what it was, but 
that's what amazes me about this. Is yes. You can be talking about something completely different. Yes. That's not even relevant to what they're going through. And suddenly it's like they hear something and, but it's not even relevant to what you were talking about. You can be talking about the sun and they hear something completely yes. different. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, totally. Yeah. I think George Pransky calls it something like the four seconds or something because he says he can have someone with him for four days, but they'll hear something in four seconds at some point. It might even be, you know, in the last day and that four seconds makes the whole thing worth it. Right. Even though they may not have heard anything for like yes. four days, right? Yeah. I remember yeah. th this particular, it's funny, right? So I've been banging on about like, cause back, back before I, I, I worked with mums, I, um, I had brought out a book called Goodbye Mr. X and it was all yes. about helping women with heartbreak. And, um, I had this firm belief that the reason why my coaching practice didn't, um, wasn't work, didn't work was because <laughs> it's crazy for me to say this now, but, um, all divorced women didn't have money. <laughs> and it was crazy because i'd been divorced and i had money right so yeah, yeah. some people have more money after they divorce i know and so what was so interesting about this was that i've been working with jamie particular coach for a year and the whole point for me to sort of kind of work with him was was because i wanted to create a practice from it and i you know i'd kind of I hadn't signed up anybody in like a high ticket program yet. Anyway, the last, literally the last minute that entire year, he said something to me, which I just meant I had a massive breakthrough. And he goes, what, what makes you think that like women don't have, like Buddha was women don't have money. That's just not true. And I suddenly saw it and I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> so the next day, I joke you not, I had a lady reach out to me and she goes, Hey, um, I'd really like to work with you. And I said, Oh, okay. Guess what? She's a divorcee. <laughs> <laughs> she paid me the high ticket fee. Yes. We had two sessions and she's like, I'm done. I was yes. like, oh, we've got an entire yes. year left. And she's like, yeah. no, I don't need it. I'm like, well, oh, do you want me to give you a no? She's like, no, it was worth it. I was like, exactly. Exactly. Oh my God. Like, yeah. Oh, okay, now there, now there, you see now, there's, there's the answer to what you asked earlier about when people say, um, you know, when you said, could anybody see this? Yes. She, she, she saw it instantly. You know, when you're talking about time, how long would it take? Yeah. She, she saw it instantly. You know, I, I, I worked, um, um, I don't know, a couple of years ago with a, with a group. We met up once a month. And it was all people, so it was people in, working in, with the principals in different fields. So there were lots and lots of different um, people there, all working, all, all with successful um, careers in this. But one of the things that came up was that um, when we were talking one day was they were talking about getting a sense of urgency because they wanted their client to get to this and I thought it was so interesting because I thought I've never ever had that feeling I've never had that sense of urgency wanting somebody to get this because to me it's so simple of course they're going to get it and I think I'm so confident they're going to get it because they already have it Leo has it as you know I'm only reminding them of something that they already have that that it wouldn't occur to me that they're not going to see something at some point. Oh, I love that, Elaine. What kind of came up for me when you were talking about that? It's like looking for your keys everywhere in the house. Yes. And you can't find them. And you can't find yes. them. And somebody just goes, it's in your pocket. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> oh, exactly. <duh>. yes. <laughs> yep, absolutely. Or, or, or looking for your phone and using the torch on your phone to find your phone because you've turned the light out or someone's asleep. And you're like, oh, really? <laughs> yeah, we don't see what's in front of us. But as I say, I, didn't, I just know that everybody can see this. And, you know, you've heard the analogy, it's something that's obviously been going around for years, that 
you know, if you look to your children, so all these people, all these moms, look to your children. They, they, they will show you. Like you said, you've learned so much from Leo. Mm. They will show you. You know, we used to live in Surrey when the last financial crash happened, and um, well, last crisis, let's say. And there were lots of people in Surrey that would work in the city because of its convenience. And um, there were lots of, I had lots of guys, they either were suffering immense stress because they'd had to lay off a lot of people and they were worried about jobs and, or they had been laid off and they'd been very successful and, and, and suddenly, were, you know, had lost who they were. But I used to say to them, who carries the most stress? Who's in the most stress? Who has the better mental health, let's say? between you and a two-year-old in a tantrum because it's always going to be the two-year-old always because as we know as you've heard lots of people talk about when they're in it they're in it a child and then when they're not they're not yeah i i really hear that so, so if mums looked at their children okay they're really 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 upset oops no they're not and you know, if you took a toy, if you took, if a child was running along with a pencil and you took the pencil off of them, because obviously you don't want them to trip over and stab themselves in the eye, I bet that that child would, there's no child that would go to bed that night and think, I can't believe she took that pencil off of me. We forget how resilient our kids are because we actually forget how resilient we are. Exactly. We f- see at some point, at some point along the way, we picked up from other people that we should keep thinking about things, that we should worry about something and children don't they're in it when they're in it they're really in it and then they're not yeah like seriously that's what i see and i guess that's why it overrides it right so we've been taught that we need to feel a certain way based on society and culture and if you're not worried about something it's like there's something wrong with you you should be worrying about this or you should yes. be worrying you're about being that. irresponsible <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> yes that's why you know yes. yeah but actually there's 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 actual responsibility in not doing any of that yes absolutely you can, you can be more responsible actually if you're not in the worry and if you're totally. not in the um overwhelm um because i don't know about you but i can't see anything when i'm totally in it of course you can't. none of us can totally totally because yeah we're consumed now but, you know, I remember Kathy Casey um, talking years ago about her son. And I think her son was at college. And she said that she'd always been a worrier when it came to her son. And he wanted to take the car back to, to college. And it was a long way away, wherever he was. And, and she said that, that, you know, she made sure she, she, she was responsible. She made sure there was air in the tyres and oil and water and petrol in the tank. And then off he went. And she said that that evening he called her to say that he'd arrived, you know, back at college. And she felt really, really guilty because she'd forgotten to worry about him all day. And, I thought that, and she said she realised that all the worrying she did, it didn't, it didn't cocoon him. The worrying about him, so she'd been worrying about his driving and is he okay, that was not going to save him from having a bump or that, that there was nothing she could do beyond... The, her responsibility was making sure that there was um, petrol in the car and you know oil and gas and air in the tyres, etc. Yeah, but we take on a lot again. I'm talking about tell me when to stop, by the way, because I'll go on and on. But Amy Chen Mills, I was in something with Amy Chen Mills many years ago, and um, a woman stood up and said, it, "This is still about children, but not exactly depression." But the, a woman stood up and said. Um, I really get what you're saying, she said, but I, I get really worried, worried about my daughter. I think the daughter was 10 because she said, when I was at school, I used to be very studious and I just wanted to get my homework done because I wanted to please people. And she said, my daughter just doesn't, doesn't study. And she said, um, she's got tests coming up to, to, you know, to go to the next school and she's just not studying for them. And Amy said, and what's that got to do with you? <laughs> and the woman said, well, I'm her mother. She said, if she, doesn't te- if she doesn't study for the test, she'll fail them. And then he said, yes. And what's that got to do with you? And she said, well, if she fails them, she won't get into the school. She won't. She went, yes. And what's that got to do with you? <laughs> and it was clear by the end of the, the, the toing and throwing that the woman was making this all about her, again, innocently. 
she was she was doing two things. She was projecting into the future and imagining her child having like living in a cardboard box under a under a railway bridge because she hadn't got into the school and then hadn't got into the college and then hadn't got into the university and then hadn't got a job. But also she was she was acting like if her daughter didn't study, that meant something about her as a parent. Because that meant people would judge her parenting skills because her daughter wasn't studying. Whereas, of course, all her responsibility was to make sure there was someone somewhere warm that her daughter could study and she'd eaten enough that she wasn't hungry. And that's it. That's it. And the more we can see that, that, that our responsibility stops with what we can do for our child, not what we can think for our child. I love that. And I love that she went down that line of questioning. Yes. Yes. Someone might, someone might even say it's impertinent or rude, but actually there's real wisdom in what she said or questioned. Yeah. And it was, it, well, you could say, you could see the question was asked with love. It wasn't, yeah, yeah, yeah. there wasn't any really aggression in it. It was just it, really, and what's that got to do with it? Because you see our responsibility, we are not responsible for our children. We are responsible when they're little for making sure their environment is safe. But, but we're, not short, we're not responsible for what they think and how they feel. We are responsible for not, make, not being mean to them so they feel unhappy. I don't mean that. But you know, I, you, know you understand what I mean. We, you know, my daughters are grown up and I would still go into mum mode and want to fix things for them. And they don't want to think me to fix anything. Sometimes they just want to offload. And so I learned that. And so I just listen. I just thought, mm, mm, oh, 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 mm, mm. And I put the phone down, they put the phone down. They don't need to deal with my thinking about their situation because I'm not thinking about it. And, and by the time they put the phone down, it's a bit like Leo and his drink. It's gone. <laughs> Whatever they were complaining about it disappeared anyway. Yeah, you know what came to mind was the Cahill Gibran um, poem. I've got it here, mm -hmm. which is, your children are not your children. They are the sons and daughters of life's longing for itself. Yes. They come through you, but not from you. And though they are with you, they belong not to you. You may yes. give them your love, but not your thoughts. Yes. For they have their own thoughts. You may house their bodies, but not their souls. For their souls dwell in the house of tomorrow. You cannot visit, not even in your dreams. You may strive to be like them, but not seek to make them like you. For life goes not backward, nor tarries with yesterday. You are the bows from which your children as living arrows are sent forth. The archer sees the mark upon the path of the infinite and he bends you with his might that his arrows may go swift and far. Let your bending in the archer's hands be for happiness. For even as he loves the arrow that flies, so he loves the bow that is stable. Yes, that's lovely, isn't it? Oh, I just love that poem. It just kind of really speaks to what you're saying and kind of, puts resilience back into the equation yes yes and and you know it, if any parent is feeling depressed and they listen to the words of that poem they can see that that the way they're feeling is, is nothing to do with their child it's nothing to do their child their child will will probably not even notice <laughs> that they're depressed so so they don't the parent the mother doesn't have to go into lots and lots of self-recrimination and shoulds and woulds and worry and about their child their child is fine and the more they don't make anything the the more that the parent doesn't the more that the mother doesn't make their feeling mean anything about them and about their lack of something because that's what it normally is um the more they can be with the feeling, I know it's not nice, and I know it's you, nobody wants to feel like that. But the more they can just be with it rather than fighting it. You know, I woke up the other morning and I was singing that nursery rhyme for some reason: um, "Row, row, row your boat, mm. yeah, um, gently down the stream." Remember, merrily, 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 life is but a dream. And I thought, wow, how true that is. And then I thought, life is so much easier when I row my boat downstream. And I let it float and I let it and I go with the flow of life. Whereas when I'm trying to float, when I'm trying to row my boat upstream and I'm, I'm fighting with everything and I'm trying to control things and I'm trying to fit life into my 
the way I think it should be, it's not easy at all. And I think that's 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 the feelings. I think the more that we can be with our feelings and just let ourselves row downstream, rather than fighting it and doing something with it and feeling bad about it, and yeah, we can be merrily, 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 merrily eventually. <laughs> I have moments of it at least. There's something that you said that reminded me of an insight I had just recently about you can still feel the you know icky feelings or whatever you want to call them feelings that you don't want to feel it mean it doesn't mean that you're not okay like like you can still have that experience and know that you're okay absolutely absolutely you know years ago when I used to do all these different modalities and you know I like to say I like an acronym because I do you know, NLP and TFT and CBT. And, and I would wake up, if I woke up in the morning, I thought, oh, I feel a bit sad. I would think, I wonder why. And then I would go into all the reasons, a bit like the guy I mentioned. I would go to all the reasons, because we can all find reasons that we feel sad. And then, and then, then, of course, my feeling would persist and it would deepen. And I would feel worse. And, and then I would try and analyse that and I'd just keep digging that hole. Whereas now, if I wake up and I feel a bit sad, it could be the remnant of a dream, could be anything. And I wake up and I think, Oh, I feel a bit sad. I wonder why. And then I think, who cares? Just leave it alone. <laughs> yeah, there's something about that, right? Where we just say, um, who cares? Like, okay, mm-hmm. I'm feeling like crap. Okay, whatever. Just yes. like, okay. Yes. Versus, oh my God, I'm feeling like crap. There must be something wrong. Can I have a Yes. Do? Yes. And as I say, digging that hole. You know, I'm a big believer in so what really i think you know and i don't mean so what is in you know i've made you upset so what i don't mean that because you know you can't make someone upset but you get you get the drift i mean more like i'm feeling upset and so what oh I'm, I'm, I'm feeling a bit low so what so it's like so what to me is like a full stop it's not a comma and then going into the reasons why i feel upset it's just like so what full stop elaine i love this like that's so precise and poignant and i and i also see how easy it is for us to go down that road of kind of what is it yes because the minute it's it's just so ingrained in us in society it's like yes i'm not feeling very well really why i know i know exactly exactly i know or 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 talking about our problems you know when i had couples come to me and i say to them do you like especially the women i know that's sexist but men don't as in my experience, often talk about their problems to their male friends as much. But for women, it can be a bonding experience. Oh, let's, let's complain about our partners. Well, when you go home after your, after your bonding experience with your girlfriend, you're probably not in a really loving mood towards your partner. You might have been when you left, but talking about all the reasons that you're not feeling so great are, are going to put you into a different state of mind. And it's the same, it's, it's the same with mums, you know, when, when, I, when my daughters were young, we used to go to the you know, mother and toddler groups and then everyone would be talking about how tired they were and I don't know, a thousand things. It, it wasn't uplifting. It felt bonding. It felt like you were part of a team, part, part, part of a group. But it, it wasn't an uplifting feeling. So what? That's better. <laughs> oh, I'm feeling really tired. Oh, so what? But it, here's, here's what I hear in that is, is that kind of response might be almost seen as not caring, right? So there's a sense that, so what? Like, it, but, but actually what I'm hearing is that's a really caring thing to ask. And I'm doing it to myself. So I'm not, so somebody else isn't saying to me, I feel upset and I'm saying, <laughs> so what? <laughs> that wouldn't be, that wouldn't come across as very caring. But that saying it to myself is actually doing exactly what you're talking about is putting myself first yes. so what i'm not i'm not i'm not going to add i'm not going to have a litany of reasons that i think i should feel bad so what move on next moment next moment oh next well moment. <laughs> there you go yeah exactly you know well, uh... yeah yeah because we know our feelings change moment by moment mm. and and so what allows the next moment to appear <laughs> very true because it has to has to it's going to anyway yes. it's going to inevitably whether we like yeah. it or not <laughs> yes oh well thank you so much elaine this has been really enlightening and i'm sure that for everybody actually i don't know 
anybody that's listening, they might, they might not have thought so. But I, I oh, think- absolutely. And you know, the wonderful thing is that that you know, I, I, it's like my my clients. I, I, I do. I, you know, I love my clients. I, but how they receive what I say is up to them. So it's it's wonderful that um, it it's uh, it allows both myself and the listener off the hook because. I don't mind what the listener gets from it. I really hope they hear something. Mm. And that means that because I, there's no pressure on them to hear something, they're more likely to. Yeah. It's, it's the carefree piece. In a caring way. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. Like carefree, caring. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Because I think, you know, from society's point of view, if you don't worry, you don't care. Yes. There's an yes. underlying kind of, thought there that, that kind of says that but actually what I've seen is is the less you worry the more you can care you're this there's, there's you've got more bandwidth mm. to care because to you're be, not so consumed yeah with totally thoughts, worrying thoughts so there's there's far more capacity mm. for caring and to be with that person as opposed to worrying about yeah and to love that person whether it's a, your child or, or a partner or your cat but to love whatever it is full out without conditions you know we all know about unconditional love or when you when you when you are caring in a in a carefree way it is unconditional well thank you elaine now Pleasure. if somebody was has been listening to this and goes i like the sound of elaine she sounds like <laughs> kind of cool and i'd like to get a little bit more of her where can they go to what can they do and how can they um connect with you well, I have um, my website, which is my name, Elaine Hilides. It's H-I-L-I-D-E-S dot com. I have a YouTube um, channel with videos on, just short videos. And I have, um, I have a, a page on Facebook called the to, Free to Be Online. It's called Free to Be Online. Um, so any of those places... Wonderful. So and they would be very welcome wherever they turn up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. So thank you so much, Elaine. It was wonderful That's to speak pleasure. to you today. And um, until the next time, bye-bye Thank you, now. Green. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And there we have it, another amazing episode of The Joy of Being. If you enjoyed this podcast, you may well enjoy the book as well. You can either download a free chapter, www.marinapearson.com slash chapter, where I go into much more depth into how we can create more time and space as mums. And if that doesn't fly and you're more curious about getting the entire book, then you can do that too at www.marinapearson.com slash pre-order. There you'll find a page with all the amazing goodies that you'll get if you pre-order it before the 10th of May. So until next week's episode, remember, you are the joy you seek.